Rod Blagojević je najmoćniji, ali i najkontroverzniji Srbin u američkoj politici svih vremena. Čovek koji je u životu prošao put kojim se ređe ide, od sjaja do očaja, od bajke koja je ličila na hollywoodsku pa do danteovskog pakla. Dete i siromašne porodice srpskih emigranata, poreklom iz Kragojevca i Hercegovine, odrastale u Čikago čisteći cipele, perući suđe i pakujući meso u lokalnoj fabrici. Da bi zaradio za fakultet, morao je mesecima da se smrzava na aljasci, radeći najteže poslove. Posle završenog fakulteta počeo je da se bavi politikom i dogurao do pozicije najmoćnijeg guvernera u Americi. Popularnost mu je rasla iz dana u dan i mnogi su već tipovali na njega kao predsjedničkog kandidata demokrata kad Barack Obama napusti belu kuću. A onda je usledio veliki pad, kada je upravo u ovoj kući 9. decembra 2008. godine uhavšen i na kraju osuđen na 14 godina zatvora zbog, kako je sudija istakao, pokušaja da preproda senatorsko mesto predsjednika Baraka Obame. Blagojević je tvrdio da je nevini da je žrtva političke igre, ali je sudija bio neumoljiv i on je završio u zatvoru. Posle osam godina provedenih iza rešetaka, tadašnji predsednik Sjedinjenih država Donald Trump mu je u maju 2020. godine ublažio presudu i pustio ga na slobodu. Iako je svoju političku karijeru decenijema gradio kao član demokratske partije, Rod Blagović je danas na suprotnoj strani. Ipak, za sebe kaže da nije republikanac, nego tramperijanac. I ne samo to, on je jedan od glavnih protagonista i aktivista u Trumpovoj kampanji za predsjedničke izbore sljedeće 2024. Kako je prošao i preživeo taj životni put od dečaka i migranta preko političkih visina pa do zatvorske ćelije, reći će nam u ekskluzivnom intervju koji sledi. Ostanite u Serbian Times. Mr. Blagojević, I really appreciate that you agreed to this interview of Serbian Times. Thank you for having us and hosting us in your home here in Chicago. Uh, first of all, I want to ask, how do you feel today after everything you've been through in the last 10 years of your life? And you went from the governor of Illinois and one of the most popular politicians in the US, many would say the future president of the United States, and you ended up in the condemned prisoner. You spent eight years in cell until President Trump commuted your sentence. How do I feel now that I'm home yes. and that's all behind me? And Verlo feel... dobro. That's how I feel. I feel very good. And As a free man, right? Very much so. Sloboda, right? It's a gift. My father taught me that because my father was no stranger to being in prison too. My father was a soldier in the Yugoslavian Royal Army before World War II. Uh, first Lieutenant, Oficir. And uh, the Nazis took my father as a prisoner of war and my Chika Milorad, who I was named after, my father and my brother and my uncle, and they spent four years in the Nazi prisoner of war camp. And then after the war, um, they didn't want to come back to Yugoslavia because it had become communist. And so they stayed in a refugee camp in Austria for another three years. So basically my father was sort of in a situation not unlike mine, where he spent seven years away. I would think about that a lot when I did my eight years in prison for politics, not for crimes. Um, and it would give me strength and inspiration to think of my father, Moj Tata, and how he did it. And I would remind myself, well, how would he want me to approach this? And I think, well, I know he'd want me to be strong and tough and, and be like a true Serb, because one thing about us, we are a strong, tough people. Mm, you gave me a good start to, to, to let, let's go back in, sure. back in time. So you were born in Chicago as a child of a Serbian immigrants from former Yugoslavia. Uh, your father is from Kragujevac or something somewhere near, right? Your mother is a Serb from Herzegovina, from Gatsko. Your father worked in a steel plant uh, in the northern suburbs of, of Chicago. Uh, correct, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. You're partially right. He, he started out at a Goodyear plant in Waukegan mm -hmm. when he first came to America, and he was there with his brother and a Croatian woman by the name of Magda ran a boarding house and Braška Pomoc, Serbian Brothers Help, helped my father and my uncle and other immigrants get placed uh, in jobs as well as a place to live for a while until they were able to get jobs. So he got that job in Waukegan and then he moved to the city because it was closer to the church. 
And back then the church was in the Wick Wicker Park neighborhood in Chicago. And, um, and got jobs working in different factories, but mostly in a steel factory called the Finkel Steel Company, uh, where he worked for many years when I was growing up. Um, and we'll have so time in this interview. They came to uh, United States in 1947, and you were born in 1956. So those were difficult years for, for immigrants. What was your childhood like? Well, my father came actually, it was like 1948, 49 when he came. Because the United States Congress, that one day his youngest son, me, would become a member of, passed a law called the Displaced Persons Act, which allowed my father and millions of others like him with these long and hard to pronounce last names to come to America and start a new life after the war. There was so much displacement in Europe at the time, after World War II. Um, and like so many immigrants, he came here, didn't have a penny in his pocket, didn't speak a word of English, and uh, made his way. And like our people know, it, it, and it's the immigrant story, was happy to be in a place that he believed was free and a place where there was opportunity to build a better life for your family. And then he met my mother and fell in love with her. She was American born, my mother. And uh, my father came from a cello, Blizu Kragoyev, it's called Veliko Krochmare. And my mother was born here, but her parents, my grandparents on her side, they were from Gatsko Herzegovina. And Have you ever been there? I've, I've never been to Gatsko Herzegovina. I've been to Serbia in 1999 during the war when I was a United States Congressman with Reverend Jackson. But I, I'd never been there before or since. And I had plans to actually do a trade mission when I was the governor to Serbia because when I was governor, uh, I met the president at the time, and we had a, 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 an economic arrangement between the state of Illinois and Serbia, a trade arrangement, and I wanted to build on that. But then, uh, well, then I got arrested and everything changed, and the rest is history. Oh, yeah. So you spent much of your childhood working all jobs uh, to help the family pay the bills. Uh, so you were shoe shiner, pizza delivery boy, uh, before working at the meat factory. Mm -hmm. Meatpacking factory, actually. Mm -hmm. So, in order to afford university costs, you worked as a dishwasher in Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was pretty tough for the for the young guy. You know what? It, it's an unusual beginning for someone who's young, right? I was nine years old the first time I got a job, shine his shoes, and uh, I did that for uh, four years from the ages of nine till I finished elementary school, thirteen. When I went to high school, it was it didn't work where I could do that anymore. Um, but ever since then, it's pretty, pretty much been work all along. And that job on the Alaskan pipeline that you talk about, well, it was such a good paying job. And the reason I was able to do it was because my father, and this is very unusual. I mean, my father was in his mid sixties and he left his job at the Finkel Steel Company to chase a job that paid a lot better, but would require him to leave his family and make sacrifices. But he did it because, and he went to the Alaskan pipeline to work basically as a janitor way up in the middle of nowhere, way up north of the Arctic Circle where it's really cold, and uh, because he loved his children and he loved his family and he wanted me to have a chance to go to college and it was a way to afford college. And I think about my father's sacrifice and, uh, and that kind of special kind of love when you're actually prepared to make sacrifices like that for yourself, for your family. And it, it moves me and I'll never forget it. And it reminds me how lucky I've been to have the loving parents that I had, because I was very fortunate, both of my mother, my parents, my mother and my father. And I think the mix, Mr. Kovacevic, of my father being from Yugoslavia, from Serbia, and being an immigrant, my mother being American born, that kind of mix, I think, was, was probably, at least in my political career, probably helpful. Because I, I just wonder if maybe if my mother came from, like the old country of my father, well, my name would probably still be Milorad instead of Rod. It would, wouldn't have been Americanized. And I would have never been elected to anything. On the other hand, maybe that would have been good because I'd have never gone to prison. But it is what it is, and I was grateful for so many of the blessings that I have in my life, and among the best, of course, are the wonderful parents that I had. And trying to live your life in a way that would please them, to follow the values they teach you, it's what I hope to try to what is the give most to my important daughters. heritage they left for you and for your brother, your parents? Well, first that they loved you as parents unconditionally. And no matter what might happen, what you might do, you always knew they had your back. They were always on your side. They loved you. And there was nothing you could do that would make them not love you. And there wasn't nothing they wouldn't do to try to make things better for you, including telling you when you're doing things wrong and, and 
the necessary things that parents have to do to correct children. So that's the first thing. But I believe, and I, 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 uh, the Bible teaches this, and my life experience shows it to me, I believe the best way to raise a child is to lead by example. And yes, it's, you know, my mother would constantly instruct me to do things, and she'd constantly you know, nag me in a loving way, and sometimes I would half listen as I got older and all that. But the best way to, I think, raise a child is to live the way you would like them to live. And so when they see you and how you live and your values, well, they follow, your children learn less by what you tell them, but more how you do it and what, how you live your life. So that's what I think about my parents. And I think both of them were just like the Serbian community. They're hardworking. It's the values of the Serbian community. F believe in God, commitment to family, and uh, all about the children, sacrificing so they can have better opportunities that they didn't have. I would say that's my, the story of my parents. And I, I wouldn't have gone as far as I did in life, notwithstanding how I fell off, um, had it not been for their sacrifice, their hard work, the opportunities they gave me to get an education, and the example that they set on how to, on how to live. And um, I mean, I, I tell my daughter stories about my parents all the time. And among the regrets I have in life is that uh, my younger daughter, my, neither one of my daughters had a chance to meet my father. He had passed away long before they were born. And my younger daughter never met either one of my parents, but my, my older daughter had a chance to be with my mother for, for three years before my mother passed away. You've been a part of the Serbian community here in, in, in Chicago. So where did the Serbs gather then? Uh, how did they spend their time together? How did they socialize? Well, we were raised uh, in a working class neighborhood in Chicago in a little five room apartment. And uh, we were raised in the Serbian church. And you what know, church did you go to? Uh, Old Holy Resurrection Church. Palmer. The one on Palmer. But before that, it was on Kedzie when we were little and we were in Sunday school. And then and my father was very active in the church. He was active in finding the property that they eventually bought on Palmer, Palmer Square. But even before that, this, before the Serbian churches here in America divided, uh, the first church was the one on Evergreen in Wicker Park. And that's the church that my mother and father were married in in October of 1950. And that's the church that uh, I was baptized in. Um, so it started there, and then the churches separated in like 1963. I remember, I remember seeing some of that as a little boy at the Libertyville, up in Libertyville, where uh, we'd have Vido Don and uh, the Fourth of July celebrations, and the politics was heated at that time. And my father was very strong against the communist regime in, in Yugoslavia, and the issue was, you know, whether the archdiocese was going to be separate here and create its own church or take orders from back there and the church is split and so the church at Palmer Square was the church first on Kedzie and then the other church was Redwood Drive and what was interesting is that really interesting is that the immigrants the so-called DPs that's what the American born Serbs would call my father or others displaced persons it was a derogatory term even within our own community you know there's a pecking order and the American born felt like they were better than the DPs. And my mother was American born, but she loved her husband and she was totally committed with my father. But a lot of her family and her cousins, they were American born. So they actually went to the Redwood Drive Church while my mother followed my father and went to uh, Old Holy Resurrection. And uh, what I find interesting is that the, the issues had to do with, you know, whether your church is going to be more rooted here in America and independent from the old country. And it was the American born that were more apt to support the church in the old country. And it was the new immigrants here who took the position that we should start our own church here and be independent. And uh, I don't know whether that's of any great interest to Serbians today, but I find that very interesting. Almost upside down, you would think it'd be the other way around. But that was the complicated and I said tough situation for the Serbian community in Chicago. Very much so. And, and, and I think there's a lot of lessons to be drawn by that. You know, I've had ups and downs in my life. One thing I was good at was politics. I mean, I ran in every election that I won. And, you know, I got pretty high up pretty fast with a name that was very unusual. And, um, I mean, I'm the only governor in American history who ever sang Tata Kupi Mi Alto. So I've been very lucky in the sense of where I got. But I think a lot of that political sense, which I have to say I have some of that, 
I think I learned early on as a little boy, just observing what was happening with our church and how it was breaking up and some of the dynamics within the church and the politics that goes along wherever people get together and they have differences of opinions. And, and uh, it's a life lesson, I think. I think that and some of the early jobs I had, you learn about life and people. And I think I was, a, I was able to take some of that and use it, not on purpose, it just was part of who I became. When I got into politics, it was just sort of a natural thing for me. I, I didn't find it very hard. You know, I guess it's not that hard to make a lot of promises, right? I can tell that you're a fighter, but yes. you've been a fighter, a real boxing fighter mm -hmm. for, for, let's say, 30 months, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, fighting for Golden Globes comp competition. Mm -hmm. uh, who turned you on to boxing? Well, I was in high school and um, I was, um, I had a friend who was, a, who, uh, his name was Emil Gattardo, Italian-American. And uh, he was a boxer, and he was good. And he boxed out of a park called Amundsen Park in the northwest side of the city. And um, I had read a book at that time on one of my heroes in history, Theodore Roosevelt. I have that bust over there on my desk. And I'd read that he was a, as he was building himself up and coming up, he was a young asthmatic child. And he was very sickly. And his father had urged him to take up exercise to make his body strong because his mind was very strong, he was a very highly intelligent man. And among the things he did growing up, and he did this when he went to Harvard in college back then in the 1880s, was he, he resolved to test himself and take up boxing because he had gone from being a weak, sickly child and he wanted to be now, you know, a big, strong, tough guy, challenging himself against another guy in the ring. And I was inspired by that story. And so I went to my friend Emil Gattardo and, and asked him, you think that I might be able to go to the gym with you and meet the coach, the trainer, and maybe look into taking up boxing myself? And that's how it started. And the uh, first time I ever got my name in a major newspaper, the Chicago Tribune, was in the Golden Gloves, when I boxed Golden Gloves. And the first time I ever met, I ever met Mayor Daly, if you remember who he was, the Daly family was political royalty in Chicago, the father at the Still. time. Yeah. Still is. Yeah, and the father at the time was the mayor, and he had been the mayor for since I, my whole life. I mean, he was mayor in 1955. He died December 20th, 1976. And this was 1974, 75, and I was just in high school still. And, and uh, before the Golden Gloves, the coaches, we'd go to some other parks and you'd do what they called show fights and you'd box somebody else from another park in the local, the neighbors from the neighborhood come in and watch the fight. And this fight was in the Bridgeport neighborhood on the south side where the Daly family was. It sounds like a script for Street Fighter. It's interesting. So Daly, the, the son, Richard M. Daly, while his father was the mayor, he was a state senator or a state representative, and he was there that night, and he passed out trophies to all of us who fought. And uh, that was the first time I ended up meeting him. And of course, years go by, I, I become a prosecutor. He's the Cook County State's attorney, so he's my boss. He's way up high, and there's 800 of us, and I'm at traffic court or in the misdemeanor branch courts. I never met my boss. And then I get elected to public office. And then in 10 years, I was governor. Now suddenly, he still thought I worked for him, by the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's kind of interesting how it all started. But there I was, you know, boxing in his park, Davis Square Park in Bridgeport. And I met him. And, and anyway, the, the boxing career was, uh, thank goodness it was short-lived. That's a hard sport. It's very brutal. And, you know, to the extent that I was crazy to get into politics, maybe it's because I took a few too many blows to the head. Um, what was your score? I, I had six fights. I won four and I lost two. And in the Golden Gloves, I won the first night. And then the next night, I had to fight again. And uh, it was a t I got TKO'd in the third round. The referee stopped the fight. But the guy was 24 years old, and I was 17, 18. And he was a, a real good counterpuncher. In fact, he was from Daly's neighborhood. And, uh, and it was a lesson that he was, he was more skillful, and he was the better fighter. But I ended up then fighting the guy that knocked him out in the Golden Gloves. Two months later, I fought him in the Park District Tournament. And that guy beat me, but it was a three-round decision. Um, but I, you know, I did all right. And, uh, but again, thank goodness it was only for that one year because it's, you know, I, I know something about boxing and, and that boxing world. And it's a very hard business. There's only a handful of the fighters that really go to the top level. And those are the guys who make all the money. And most everybody else, they're left behind. And they're damaged because of the blows to the head. And, right. and over the years when I was uh, a lawyer, when I was a, a state representative, a lawmaker, and a congressman, and then governor, you know, I kept up with some of those guys that I knew growing up, and I tried to help them. In fact, I just saw one the other day. Um, 
It was good to see him. He was a good fighter. His name is Jimmy Amabile. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, who was your who was your idol? Ali, Fraser, or Foreman? Go, oh, growing up, well, we all we all like we all loved Muhammad Ali in the seventies. Um, he was controversial in the sixties, but one of the fighters that I really loved was um, Manos de Piedra, Hands of Stone, Roberto Duran, a great fighter. And my style was nothing like that. That guy was a fierce, tough fighter. I was more of a I had a good, pretty good jab and try to move around a little bit and not get hit too much. But um, anyway, I wasn't all that great. It was, it was a, I did it more for the character, the building of the character to test myself. And I should say something about that because when you're in the ring like that by yourself and you're in front of 1,500 people or 2,000 people, and that was at the St. Andrew's gym where they used to hold the golden gloves and the media's covering it, and you don't have teammates. It's not like playing soccer or, of course, basketball or baseball or football. It's just you and the other guy. And then you got all those people watching. And you have to, you have to have the resilience to be in there and rely on yourself. And then all the years would pass by. Now I'm in politics, a different kind of arena. In some respects, in many respects, far less fair. You know, in boxing, the worst thing they can do to you is hit you below the belt. But in politics, they stab you in the back. But I think some of those things that you learn from boxing, you can apply in the polit political world. And I remember my first television debate on ABC, and it was in the governor's race, and you know, it was going to be a pretty good audience watching it. And they were counting down with the camera. And 10 seconds, and we'll start. And the three of us who are the Democratic candidates for governor, we're going to be on TV, we're behind podiums. And you, it's like getting in the ring. You, you feel the, the butterflies and the stage fright a little bit because you got to now compete. And I remember thinking, you know, saying a short little prayer, and then I remember thinking to myself, this is nothing compared to what it was like when I had to get in a ring and the other guy is trying to kick your ass. The worst thing that could happen here is someone says something bad about you. And uh, it calmed me down, it gave me the strength I needed, and I went on to win that election. Okay, after graduation from high school in Chicago, you have become a student of Northwestern University in Evanston. Uh, so you graduated in 1979 with B.A. in history. Later on, you earned your J.D. Uh, from Pepperdary University School of Law, right, in 1983. Yes. Uh, what was your student life like? Well, at, at Northwestern, time? I was a good student at, in college. I liked what I, the classes that I was taking. I, I, I've always Why had history? A, yeah, I've always had, a, I've always had a hist uh, an interest in history. As you can see, these books... Mr. Kovacevic actually read some of them. Um, but, and so I, I, I did well in my history classes and I did well in the, the English literature classes that I was taking. I was very interested in it. Um, and I felt it was really important for me to do well because my parents were working so hard, making sacrifices so that I could go on to law school and be a, law, a lawyer. My father was very determined that his sons and me in particular didn't have to work as hard as he did in the steel mill. And he would take us to the Finkel Steel Company and show us you know, what that place was like, all the, the furnaces and all the heat and, the, and the, the dirt and the grind and the grime and the, hard, you know, the, the hardness of the job. So I, I had to do good in school. When I got to law school, not so good. I mean, I, I got through it, but I wasn't exactly setting the world on fire in law school. And I think part of it was, you know, it was in Malibu, California, that school. You got movie stars all over the it's place. It's hard to learn there. I was single and young and a lot of pretty girls around and I'm Serbian. And Hollywood is close. And I'm Serbian, right? And you know how we mm -hmm. are. And um, so uh, not so good at school, but I, I did get through. And, and then I passed the bar exam the second time around. And I had to become a lawyer. And, and um, but so, yeah, but that too, you know, it's interesting. You can learn a lot of, from books. And I, I strongly believe that that's, it's a, the way to acquire knowledge is the way to acquire wisdom is by knowledge. And the more you read, the more you learn the more likely you are to have wisdom. But the better teacher always, notwithstanding, I think what's good to do when it comes to reading, the better teacher is always experience, your life experience, the things you learn and see by being out and about and living life. Whether it was shining shoes or boxing the golden gloves or working on the Alaskan pipeline, washing pots and pans 10 hours a day, seven days a week. The pay was so good, double time on Sundays, right? Time and a half over 40 and the pay was great. Um, or whether you're in law school in Pepperdine in Malibu and you're not in the law library like you should be, but you're out and about doing the other things that young men might do, you'll learn about life. 
And those, th those life lessons, hopefully you apply them. And frankly, even in prison, and certainly in prison, the eight years that I did there, that was, those were eight years of learning a lot. Reading a lot and acquiring knowledge, but learning a lot about life and about people and getting a better understanding even of the political scene in America today from that vantage point after experiencing what I experienced. And I see what they're doing to President Trump is what they did to me. And uh, I hope you can ask me questions about President mm -hmm. Trump so I can sing course, his praises. Of course. Because uh, uh, he's great. He will come to that. Okay. Uh, but what I want to ask you, uh, were you interested in politics in, in the student days mm -hmm. in California? Because I find an interesting fact that you voted for Ronald Reagan in 1980 and voted for his re-election in 1984. Uh, you, although you, you later built your career in the Democratic Party, uh, does that mean you were a Republican as a student and young man? I was called what they, what they call a Reagan Democrat. Ronald Reagan was very popular uh, in both his elections. His second one was a major landslide. He won. 49 out of the 50 states, which has only happened once before in American history, and that was Richard Nixon in 1972. But I was a Reagan Democrat, and there were a lot of Reagan Democrats like me, like my mother. She grew up as a Democrat um, in, during the Great Depression because of Franklin Roosevelt and, and the government programs that were helping families, like immigrant families, like hers. My father was a Republican because he came after World War II, and he was strong anti-communist. And the Republican Party was a lot tougher against communism than the Democrat Party. So my father gravitated to the, uh, to the Republican Party. So we had both in our family, you know, my mother and father. But all of us voted for Reagan and because, you know, we, you know, for a lot of different reasons. And I think maybe... What the, was the difference between uh, Reagan Democrats and regular Democrats back in time? The, and, and even today, there's a difference, and even more so today. The Democratic Party today is very different from what, what it was when I was in it, and that was only 10, 15 years ago when I was active in it as the governor. But um, back then and even today, the, sometimes the Democratic Party loses its way and forgets who it's supposed to be on the side of. And too many times sometimes in modern American history, the Democratic Party suddenly becomes a party that no longer loves its country. It's, it's a country that, it, it's a party that is so caught up by some of the fringe elements that Things like saluting the flag or standing up for the flag, things like supporting the police, having faith in God, calling God, God. I mean, Biden just put out a memo or a proclamation a couple of years ago, didn't even mention the name God. He talked about a divine presence. He's kind of the, 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 the phrasing and the words of things that don't maybe sound like they're necessarily that important in real life, but I believe they are. They, don't, they indicate values. And when the Democrat Party gets away from the fundamental values that I was raised to believe in, and that is, you know, family and faith and hard work and America as the land of opportunity that gives you the gift of freedom and a chance to get ahead in life and build a better life for your family because you value hard work and, and a party that stands for people who work hard and get rewarded by their hard work or the risk that they take when they start up a business. See, that was supposed to be what the Democratic Party was. And it was at some at a different time, it, but it's not that party anymore. In fact, this is the party that wants to tax all those people, who are the ones who are the strivers, the ones who are getting the things done. And when I was the governor, I was fighting with my own party, Madigan, who ran everything down in Springfield and had been there for forty years, and he was the little he was the political boss. All they wanted me to do was to raise taxes on the people that would never do it. At the same time, I wanted to provide opportunities for healthcare for families and things like that. And I did it by finding money from other places. So it was always a fight. And you had said earlier, well, you're, you're a fighter. And I, 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 of course I am, yes I am. But then it's in my DNA, isn't it? Because that's who we are as Serbs. I think it's inherent. And I think a lot of it, I think a lot of who we are as people today is how our people evolved over the generations and over the centuries. And you know, you think of Vito Dan and you think of Kosovo and you think of what happened um, with, under the Ottoman Empire. And all these years later, we're not giving up. We're not just going to just forget about it and say, oh, that's not ours. So that kind of mentality, never giving up, always fighting, and even when you get your ass kicked, getting up again, when you're fighting big, powerful forces. I think about what NATO did to Serbia in the late 90s when I was in Congress. 
And I think about what happened to me, how big powerful forces came, I see parallels. And I would think about that a lot when I was in prison and remind myself there's something about, you know, something about our, my heritage and our heritage where we find ourselves in those places. And the people, the Serbian people never give up and they never quit. And they always rebuild and pick themselves up. The least I can do is do the same thing. And so I was inspired by many things when I was in that lonely wilderness for all those years. My mother, my father, being strong for my children, my wife, um, and inspired by the Bible and by the heritage that I was lucky enough to be raised in, our heritage, the Serbian heritage, that you fight against powerful forces when you know you're right and you don't give up, you don't give in, and when they kick your ass, you get up again and you keep fighting. Mm, let me get back to the history uh, a, a little while. So, so how did you decide to, to become a politician? Because you first served at the uh, attorney office in the Cook County. And what was happened that you joined the Democratic Party and became a politician? Well, in Chicago, when I was growing up, and it's still the case today, um, it's like back in Yugoslavia in the 70s, my father would tell me that, you know, what he was hearing from people, friends that were still in Yugoslavia under Tito and the communist regime. The only way that you could move up in government was you had to be a member of the Communist Party. And in Chicago, it was the only way you could move up in politics was you had to be a member of the Democratic Party. There was really no Republican Party of any kind of meaning in the city. When I was growing up, it was changing in the 1990s when I got started, but it was still very much Democrat. And um, my opportunity to run for office wasn't anything I planned. I always felt like it was something that I was interested in because of my interest in history. But I was in no place to pursue a political career. I mean, I, my mother and father didn't have any relationships or connections with people in high places. They were working people. And, you know, so I went out to be a lawyer and practice law. And I had a lot of represent, I represented a lot of serves as my clients in various cases. And, um, but then I felt I met my wife, Patty, and, and fell in love with her. And she, her father was a local Democratic political leader. And once I was in the family, I would help him out politically and in the Democrat Party locally. And then he was an alderman. He was an alderman. Chicago. Yeah, he was an old Chicago alderman and a, what's called a Democratic Ward Committeeman. And he was a very influential alderman. And he'd been there since the mid 70s. So he'd been there a while and uh, had a very strong political organization here in this neighborhood that we still live in. And uh, uh, but the politics with some of the other Democrat leaders in his area, he was at cross purposes with them. And they had decided who were gonna be the state lawmakers in, the, in this North Side area, in many, area, many districts. And he was gonna have somebody, he was gonna have nobody that was affiliated with him. And in that world where you're the political boss, if you don't have a state lawmaker, you look weak. And you are weakened politically because you have less influence in the process. You don't have somebody going down to Springfield fighting for your neighborhood and those things. So he was right about trying to do something about it. So at the last minute when he realized that he had been betrayed by his state lawmaker and that political deals were being made by some of the other ward bosses to cut him out, he was frantic and desperate to find a candidate and he just happened to have one in the family. You have repeated his history after that because you have a lot of fight. You had a lot of fight with lawmakers in the state of Illinois, right? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. And um, I did. But my beginning began when Patty's dad, my father-in-law, called me on a Sunday morning and called the two of us and asked to come over to the house and told us what happened. And he asked me if I'd be willing to think about running. And I remember, I remember he knew I liked history. And, and uh, I remember him saying, we're probably going to lose because they're all against us. And uh, plus, who's going to vote for your name? I was Back then, that was a real issue. You know, and the Serbian community in Chicago is one of the bit largest communities of Serbs in America. But compared to the other ethnic groups, we're very small. It's not like there's any what's called a Serbian district where you got to have a Serbian congressman represent. There was the Italian district where Frank Anunzio represented. There was a Polish district, Dan Rostenkowski, the Jewish district that Sidney Yates represented. And the political leaders would back candidates from those ethnic groups for those districts, the Latino district, which was Gutierrez at the time, and then the, the black districts and stuff. But there was no Serbian one. We were just too small. And the congressional district that I would eventually run in and win in 
was a combination of the, what was the old Italian district, the Jewish district, and the Polish district, plus gentrified Lincoln Park, higher income neighborhoods on the lakefront. So it was a real mix, which was, in, again, because there was no great one particular group that dominated. It gave me a chance when I ran against a Polish woman, for example, and 60, you know, 63% of the voters in the district were women, and, and the Polish community was the largest ethnic group still. But the fact that it wasn't just all one ethnic group was an advantage for me. It gave me a chance to be able to compete. But um, he suggested that we'd probably lose, but it was my chance to run, and I did, and, and I uh, embraced the opportunity, and it was one fun. Elections. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, so what changed in your life when you started to engage in, in politics, in your private life, I mean? Um, life gets complicated when you're in a, in a business like that because it's, just, it's, a, it's such a t rough and tumble business, politics. I, I think if you were to ask my wife, Patty, I, in fact, I know, I mean, she would, looking back, she would prefer I never had gotten into politics and I just stayed a lawyer and, uh, you know, I was building up a nice little practice and I was on my way to getting rich as a lawyer. And then politics intervened and I dropped all of that to chase the political life. And I think it's partly because of the those history books that I read. But no, it, it changes dramatically. And you know, the interesting part of the business is, you know, when you're just at the lower level, you're really not a threat to anybody. But the higher you go up, you become, you become threatening to the other political forces that are way up high as well. And then it becomes a question of, uh, what you stand for, what it is that you, you want to do for the people, the priorities that you're making. Are you just going to be someone who goes along and gets along just because you have a position, but you don't really do anything to make a difference in people's lives? Or are you going to be true to the promises that you make and actually go in there and fight for the people? Fight for the people. We all say it. I'm going to go fight for the people. But when most of these people get elected to office, they stop fighting for the people. They join the club on the inside and they all, you know, they pretty much divide up the pie that benefits them and the special interests at the expense of the people. And I think one of the, I think the chief reason, the chief reason why Donald Trump is such a threat to the establishment in America is because he's a man who was not in politics, was so successful in business and entertainment and- Alien. And he went there to really shake things up and change things and make it work better for people. And they know that, and that's why they want to destroy him. And I was that at a smaller level. And, you know, politics is a game where you have to be willing to compromise to get things done. But it, you have to be in a strong position to push hard for the things that you really want to get those cynical political leaders to be for those things. And it's, you know, I was up against a guy, Madigan, and the establishment down there in Springfield that had been running things for 45 years. And so when I got there, and I used to be a state rep under this guy, and he felt like I was just, you know, I still worked for him. And I felt I was... I had a larger responsibility to the people who elected me. And so, you know, we, we, got, we got a lot of things done for people. And I really believe, and I, I just know that if you think about, well, what have I ever gotten from a governor in my life? I mean, there's all kinds of families all over Illinois whose children who were able to get health care because of my policy, the All Kids program, and saved lives, children's lives. Women, pap smears and mammograms who are uninsured can now detect their cancer early and be treated because of what we did when I did. Three and four-year-olds go to preschool. Every senior citizen when I was the governor got free public transportation and the disabled too. And every one of these things you would think would be easy for Democrats to pass for the people because we say we're for them. They were all hard. They were all hard. And, I, and by doing it, I, I was forcing myself into the process. And I would sometimes do these things without the legislature. I simply do it by what's called executive action. And that's why they wanted to throw me out of office because they said I was exceeding my authority. And it turned out I was right. I had the authority to do those things, but it was hard. And uh, when you get in a place like that and the stakes are so high because people get rich on these things, you know, there's a lot of people that are super rich because of the way things are run in Washington and in our state capital, Springfield and in state capitals all over the country. And if you're down there shaking things up and changing things and you're taking the money away from certain special interests and then investing it in, things that actually help ordinary people, you're going to piss off a lot of people and they're going to try to destroy you. And I think that's part of the explanation, a lot of the explanation of what happened to me. And I know it's what they're doing to President Trump now. The stakes there are even far higher. And um, so 
when you're in a situation like that and you have these people that are out to destroy you, which is, which happens in politics at every level, but when you're way up high, it becomes a lot more lonely. Your family is drawn into it because they love you and they care about you and now they're, they become vulnerable. And in this new politics where they destroy you personally and trump up fake charges based on lies and things that aren't crimes, and they criminalize that to throw you in jail. Well, of course, it was for our family very difficult. And, you know, it's a miracle that I'm home. And President Trump did it, and my wife, Patty, she was unbelievable in what she did to try to get President Trump to do what he did to bring me home. You were sentenced to 14 years in prison, and the judge said for trying to sell Barack Obama's mm. Senate seat. So how did you feel when the police came to this house to arrest you? Yeah, what was well, the feeling? I felt like, uh, boy, I felt my, you know, this is this is the sort of stuff my father fled Europe from. This kind, these kind of, you know, KGB type tactics where they come to your house, the police, and arrest the sitting governor, and there were SWAT teams around my house. But see, all these things they've done to me, they're now doing to Trump, and they started at that level. And it was shocking and it was completely unexpected and everything changed. And, you know, the whole idea of the so-called sale of the Senate seat, it never happened. I was never trying to sell a Senate seat. It all started when Obama sent an emissary to me to make a political deal. He started the whole thing. He was the president-elect on an election night. We're all down there at Columbus, uh, down at uh, Grant Park, historic night. And I'm approached by a labor union boss who was close to me and Obama. And he said, Barack called me last night, he wants me to come and see you. And, Talk about making a deal for the Senate seat. And I said, sure, come and see me. And so we, I started talking about potential things we can make a deal on. Political things. Routine political horse trading is what the appellate court eventually called it when they reversed the convictions on those fake charges. It was a the lie. things a politician doing all the time, right? Absolutely. And Obama started it, but he didn't do anything wrong. But if I'm trying to sell the Senate seat, he's trying to buy it. But he wasn't. It was just routine politics. But they had me in custody and they wanted me to start talking. And they wanted me to talk about him. And I wasn't there to protect him. I was there to, to protect me and what was right. And that they were criminalizing things that aren't criminal at all, but they're routine in politics. And I was not going to give into it. And so it was a long, long, hard fight. I fought back publicly. Never took a penny. No one ever even says I ever took a single cent or a gift or a vacation or any of those things. I was very careful to never do those things. I'm like the, I'm the only guy in politics who didn't get rich, right? But I You're fought still back. In the same house, right? Yes, and, uh, and we never quite finished it. It's, it still needs to be, the basement's a mess. It needs to be fixed, renovated. The long and the short of it is, you I have to You claim that someone back. set you up. So can you tell us who was the man who set you up or the group of people, whatever? Well, I don't know that there was any one single person that set me up. I do think that there was a conspiracy of the political leaders in Illinois. I think Madigan had a hand in it, working with the U.S. Attorney's Office then. And it was bipartisan Republicans and Democrats, because those people were Republicans who did it to me. Fitzgerald, the U.S. attorney, is a lion, sleazy, just a dishonest guy. He was appointed by a Republican president. The, uh, the judge was appointed by a Republican president. The appellate court, all three of them, were Republican appointees. Now, th these are all Democrats doing it to Trump. And my position is, not. These people who are in the courts, who are, who have the power of the prosecutors and judges who are supposed to be all about doing what's right and providing justice for people, they've been politicized. They've become what used to be the case in Soviet Russia and the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. And our country is now facing, I think, the greatest constitutional crisis in our history since the Civil War. And that's these weaponized prosecutors who injected themselves in the political process and are trying to prevent a guy who's running for president from becoming president, that's Trump, and hijacked a Democrat governor twice elected by the people, that's me. And uh, they're corrupt, and they should be held to account, and I could never give in. And, you know, people would ask me after they failed to convict me on their fake charges at the first trial, well, make a deal with these people. And they wanted to. They were going to, you know, floating 18 months if I made a deal. In I, members of my family, even were asking me to do it because they were caught up in some of it. But I could not possibly do it because it was just so wrong. And I was not, I wasn't a business person where I could make a business decision. See, I was different. I was the governor of Illinois and I had a responsibility to protect the rule of law so I can never give in. And anyway, to your 14 years that you talk about, 
they gave me that because even though I never took a cent and there was none of that corruption or those gifts or any of that stuff, they did it because, and because they were trying to bury me and with me the truth. And I, I'd still be there if Trump didn't do what he did. And I think part of why Trump did it was he knew me personally and I had a nice relationship with him. I was very lucky that way because I did the TV show Celebrity Apprentice. And even then he was telling me I was getting screwed and then he admired how I was fighting back. And he was keeping an eye on it the whole way. Never in my wildest dreams do I think he's ever going to be president when I'm doing that show in 2009. I never thought he'd, why would he want to get into politics? The guy living that kind of life. And then he becomes the president. And I, we've been disappointed by the courts at one time after another. And Obama, who I had endorsed as the first governor, Democrat governor to endorse him when he was going to be, he was viewed as a long shot against Hillary Clinton. Then he passes me by, even though he started the whole thing. And then within a month after Obama left and didn't help, I'm called into the case. But he helped you to, to get to the office of, of the governor. No, he didn't. In not. the first time in nah, he didn't. 2002, right? No. No. He showed up at meetings on policy. That's nothing. He, he didn't do anything. I helped him. I was the first governor to endorse him. I was, and gave him credibility for his race against Hillary Clinton. And then you know, he's very talented politically and he went on to do you know, to win. It was historic. Uh, and I appointed a lot of people that he asked me to appoint. I had a good relationship with him, but he wasn't at all active or helpful in my campaign for governor. And that's okay. But he passed me by when I'm sitting in prison for something he started. And, uh, and that's probably why he did it. It's because his hands were very much involved like mine were. And uh, that's why I think he passed me by. You, you made a lot of enemies uh, within powerful lobbies and companies, the pharmaceutical industry, the yeah. gun manufacturers, uh, and finally the legislators in the state of Illinois, because you didn't want to raise taxes, right? So uh, just also just a few days before the arrest, you threatened to stop the state's dealing with Bank of America Corporation right. over a shutdown factory in Chicago. So do you perhaps see this as as this is a reason uh, why you ended up in prison. Yes, yes. I, I challenge the establishment on the, on the side of the people. It sounds like political bullshit when I say it, but it's true. The day before I was arrested, I went to the Republic Windows factory on Clybourne Avenue on the north side of the city, and they had 45 to 50 people working there, mostly immigrants, Latino immigrants, working people very much like our people, right? Very much like my immigrant father worked in a place like that. And all these politicians were showing up, Democrat politicians, solidarity for these workers. We're all for them. Because what had happened was, if you remember back in 2008, the Lehman Brothers scandal, they collapsed, the banks started collapsing. And the, one of the principal reasons why Obama was elected was because everybody's retirement funds were being cut in half because of the, the collapsing economy. And then the taxpayers they had to bail out these big financial institutions. It was called the TARP legislation, TARP bailout. And part of the, one of the conditions in that legislation was that if a company is about to fall, go under, that these banks, as a condition to get our tax dollars, had to provide lines of credits to these companies to keep people working, to keep them in their jobs. And this particular company on the north side, Republic Windows, had been in business since the 1920s and had these 45 to 50 workers, and the Bank of America was not providing them the line of credit they needed to, to keep afloat and stay in business, which was a direct violation of the federal tax dollars that they received to bail them out. And unlike all the other politicians who just gave lip service to say, we're on your side, we're on your side, but offer no solutions, the beautiful, beautiful part about being governor, which was the best part of the job, you have a lot of power. You really can do things. And that just bunch of political bullshit where you show up, I'm for you, but you do nothing for anybody. And so we through the weekend, leading up to the Monday, the next day I would be arrested at six o'clock in the morning. I don't know that, that Monday. I go to the Republic Windows. It was a very cold day in, in December and met with the workers and they announced what we were doing. And that is the Bank of America gets $2 billion worth of business, $2 billion that the governor's administration provides in deposits to their banks. We're going to suspend doing business with these people until they do right by this company and other companies where they provide these lines of credits because they're supposed to do it because the federal law says they're supposed to do it. And within 
six, seven hours of that day, they were scrambling, working with us, and they made a deal. And we would, they would provide the line of credit to, in the, to that company, keep those guys working, the men and women working there. And, uh, and then we would maintain our relationship in those deposits with the Bank of America. It was a test case. It was, it was gonna be a big story all around America. In fact, I was invited to be on the Today Show the next morning, but I couldn't make it because I got arrested at six o'clock in the morning. And then everything changed. Let's talk about your days in, in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have the, the respect of, of your fellow inmates? Over there? I did, mostly. Yes, I did. I, was, I had two things going for me. And by the way, I'm writing a book about that. And I hope to have my book out in the next couple of months, maybe even before that. But I'm writing a book about my experiences in prison as a governor. And you know, I should point out to your listeners, uh, Nashe, Nashe, how do you say our people? Nashe, Nashe Ljudi. Nashe Ljudi, Nashe Ljudi. Ljudi that I, I, I'm the only governor to be put in a higher security prison. I mean, they, for the first 32 months, I'm in a prison with... You know, every street gang that you can imagine, Crips and Bloods and Sureños and Norteños and Aryan Nation, Nazi white guys. There were murderers in the prison I was in, bank robbers in the prison I was in, sex offenders. Only 2%, 2% were, you know, like business crimes and only one governor was me. And you know, my home was a six foot by eight foot prison cell, like you see in the movies. They got the gates and the bars and you're shut in like that. It's really a depressing, desolate experience, wretched. So I was in real prison. And then the final uh, In this situation, you were playing rock and roll with Jailhouse Rockers. <clears throat> the yeah, band that you right. Among the things there. I did to help me get through the time was I formed a band there called G Rod of the Jailhouse Rockers. And I sang um, some songs, Elvis songs and things like that. I had 2,896 days to learn the word to that song. But no, I, I was treated with a great deal of respect there for two reasons. And it's a different world when you're in prison because almost every one of those guys are, are there for what they said they did. They did it. They're almost all real criminals. And a lot of them are not, they're, they're criminals, but they're not necessarily bad guys. They're just guys who go the wrong way. And there's a lot of reasons why it happens their upbringing. Like in the other Elvis song in the ghetto. There's a lot of, just of like course. Chicago and so But that's right. right. That's exactly right. And you know, with some of them, it's a family business. You know, they're, you know, they were like father and son, the drug dealers, things like that. But I had respect because I was a, they watched me walk into prison on TV. They're watching me live on CNN and Fox News and NBC and ABC walking in. They covered me walking into prison live on TV. The next minute, there I am with them. But the other one, the bigger, the bigger one, far more important, which gives you real respect, is you, you, you don't want this, but that's one advantage is the 14 year sentence. When you get a big sentence in that world, those guys say, he didn't talk about anybody. He didn't snitch. He didn't sell anybody out to save himself. Because that's one that's of the, the values code. in that world. It is the code. And when I walked in with that, they felt like this guy's stand up. And they treated me with great respect. And in the very beginning, they were kissing my ass. It was really, really kind of unusual. Um, but are you still in contact with several of these guys? Sure, several of them, yeah. You, you know, you're there for a long time, you get to know them, they become your friends. I'm trying to help a few, actually. After being released from prison in February 2020, yeah. Uh, you launch a podcast called The Lightning Rod. Uh, do you really feel like Lightning Rod? I, I, and I need to explain uh, the meaning of the word in the American slang for those of our viewers who don't know. A Lightning Rod is someone who is taking all the blame or criticism in a situation, although other people or things are responsible too. So do you still feel like an innocent man or like a victim of a political game? Both. I know I'm an innocent man, and yes, I know I'm a victim of a political game. Lightning Rod. Yeah, now the name of that podcast, I don't know if that's why we, it was named that. ABC named it because uh -huh. they were doing it. Um, but I think it fits. It was, it was okay. Um, but I'm doing different things. Now. I, don't, I don't spend... You know, I, I put the podcast on hold just because... 
you know, I have a lot of catching up to do. My kids have grown up and I was making $62, $63 a month for eight years in prison. I went to law school for that. I went to college for that. So, you know, my wife heroically has built up a business. She does insurance and she does, uh, helps employees or employers with employee benefits. And she does a real good job and has been able all by herself to build this business up for her clients and keep us in our home and afford the parents private school for our daughters. All this while I'm making $63 a year because I'm stuck in prison. And Patty is such a hero in uh, so many ways. And I hope we can talk some more about her a little bit. But uh, now that I'm back, the podcast was fun, but I, I wasn't earning the kind of money that I, I earned doing other things. And I had to put my family first above sitting at a podcast just expressing my opinions all the time. And I, I like what I'm doing. I'd rather do this, build a better life for my family, which is long overdue than um, be some political pundit that just analyzes the politics. And I've never really been that comfortable with being that anyway, because I was more of a guy in the game rather than the guy describing what the guys are doing who are in the game. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't do the podcast anymore, but I'm working on a documentary film now, and I'm writing a book. I do consulting work for some clients that I have. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things I'd like to share with your listeners and your viewers is, I don't recommend prison for any good person. You shouldn't ever have to do something like that, and you won't, hopefully, in most cases. But if you find yourself in a place like that, and then you finally get out of it, and you're back home, and you've got Sloboda, you've got freedom, you're with your family, everything is nicer. Everything is nicer. The simplest things I noticed that I never noticed before when I was so busy in the race of life trying to get ahead, I noticed simple things, and they're great. They're nice, because I, I hadn't had them for so long. And where I was was so wretched. And so... That's a new meaning of life. Very much so. Yeah, very much so. And, and I'm, I'm almost grateful for the fact that that lesson I had to learn. But I wish it wasn't eight years. Maybe it would have been better if it was only eight months. But it is what it is. And God mm -hmm. has a plan for us. And we'll see where it takes me. Uh, President Trump released you from prison. Uh, did you know him before instead of that one appearance in... in Apprentice? Well, I met Donald Trump the first time in October of 2002 in New York at Yankee Stadium. The owner of the Yankees back then was the legendary George Steinbrenner. And I was the Democrat candidate for governor of Illinois. And we hadn't had a Democrat governor in 26 years, but I'm on my way to be the first one in 26 years. And I'm way ahead in the polls. And all of a sudden, people from around the country, Hollywood and New York, they want to do fundraisers for me. I don't even know who they are. And George Steinbrenner was one of them. And so at Yankee Stadium, he held this fundraiser for me in October during a playoff game against the Anaheim Angels, and in walked Donald Trump. And he was highly, rec very recognizable. And he walked in, he's very tall, very strong presence. And he walked in with a guy that's short but very recognizable too because he was on TV every morning on NBC. His name was Regis Philbin. And the two of them walked in, and Trump came right up to me and introduced himself. Of course, I knew who he was. And uh, he reached into his jacket, pulled out an envelope, and handed it to me with a check in it. And he contributed to my campaign. That's the first time I met him. And then the next year I met him again at Madison Square Garden in New York when I was out there raising money. And that was pretty much it. And then I got arrested and everything happened. And, and then he had invited me on Celebrity Apprentice, his very successful show. And he was great to me on that show. And he would tell me off camera how I was getting screwed and how much he admired the fact that- When was, was that? This was October of 2009, how, how I was getting screwed. and how he admired how I was fighting back, and he knew guys that have, go, are going, have gone through what you're going through, but they hide in a corner, really admire your guts, things like that, he would say. Little did either one of us know that years would go by, he'd be the president that would free me, and that he'd be facing the same stuff. It's really amazing how life works. But he was really kind, too. And I, people don't realize, you know, he's a strong, tough guy, Trump is. He's also very, very loyal to people that he likes, and he's very kind. And at the last episode of that show, in, uh, which was filmed in, in uh, February of 2010. There was one final episode where the final two contestants are there and all the others who've been fired already, including me, were on the stage. And Trump was asking me questions in front of a live audience of about 750 people at New York University. And I asserted my innocence and a lot of people in the audience started laughing. And my little girls were there uh, and my wife Patty were there in the audience. And, at that time in uh, 2009, 
2010. My daughter Amy was 13, and our little Annie was six. It's little girls. And, you know, they're hearing the, the, the laughter at my expense, where I'm asserting my innocence. And the show continued, and it was all fine. They picked the winner, and then Patty and I, and Annie and Amy, my children, were on an elevator, leaving the university, going down, and Trump walks in. The show was over, and walked in, and I introduced him to my wife and my children. And when the elevator got down to the ground, uh, we stepped out. He said, I, I want to say something to you kids and to my daughters. He's six foot four. He's six foot three. He's a very big, tall man. And he gets down in, his, you know, in that sort of crotch position, you know, so he can get to the level of my daughters. And he said really nice things about me because he had recognized that earlier that audience was laughing. They were kind of mocking me because I was asserting my innocence. And he was telling them how strong I was and I fight for what's right, and that they should be proud of their father. I'll always remember that. There were no TV cameras. He gets no credit for that. It was just one of these kind things that some, a, a good person does to little children when he sees something that might be hurtful to them. And uh, I think about that all the time. And then we said goodbye. He wished me luck. And, and then a couple of months later, he wrote me a very nice letter. And then now, just about four or five months ago, he invited me to go to Mar-a-Lago because he put that letter in a book that he put out, letters that he received from presidents Nixon and Reagan and Clinton and Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles and, and me and Oprah and me. Um, and that was the beginning of the great friendship, right? Well, it's been, and it, now it, you're running campaign for the I'm doing everything I can to defend. I'm fighting for him. Yes, of course I am. Because what they're doing to him is so wrong because he's a f very good person and he's, he, he'll be a great president for America. And he's got a good sense, a good sense of the unfairness in the Balkans and what NATO did to Serbia. And I know this for a fact. And it doesn't hurt that his wife is uh, Slovenka. Is that how you say it? Slovenia? Yes. Slovenka. Slovenia. Yeah. So. How did he hire you? Pardon me? How did he hire you for the campaign? Well, he didn't hire me. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this voluntary. I don't. Oh, really? But I, I, I talked to just media people, and they asked me if I'll go on television and, and make the point of, you know, argue on his side based on my, my own life experience and a Democrat talking about it. Is helpful to him. I hope. So you you were a Democrat and now you. I'm a Trumpocrat. 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 Okay, that, that's a Democrat new. for Trump. <laughs> right. So have you changed, or has the politics in the United States changed in the meantime? Well, I think uh, both. I think a lot more of the politics has changed. I've changed. We all changed over time, don't we? If we if we're if we're trying to be honest and trying to learn from life and from experience. So in some respects, I've I've changed. My viewpoints have changed in some areas. But I'm still mostly where I used to be. Some change. But the Democratic Party has changed dramatically. It's unrecognizable to me. That's another thing about the Democratic Party. We used to be, we understood the importance of having police officers to fight criminals. And you know, now there's bad cops. I had 2,896 days in prison because of bad cops. But still, for every bad police officer, there's 100 good ones. And for every sincere politician, there's probably 100 fake ones. And these politicians in the Democrat Party, what they're doing to the police is outrageous. And I say it's racist because the police presence is most needed in the areas where there is the most crime. And those are the areas where black people live. And what they allow to happen, the Democratic political leaders in those black neighborhoods, to those communities, to the good people that live there who don't have the kind of police presence that they should have or feel that the police can do the hard things that are necessary to go after those gang bangers who are committing those crimes. They would never allow that to happen in my neighborhood where I live or the, where white people live. And it's a form of racism. And yet they're the first ones to call the other side racists. It's really sickening. And there is an element, a very significant element of racism in, in today's Democratic Party. I call it plantation politics. It's they, they don't want the black community to no longer be dependent upon government services. They're, they're not interested in developing black business, black capitalism, investment in black entrepreneurs. They'll do some so they can say they're doing something, but they don't, they're not willing to make that strong commitment that I was trying to do when I was the governor. And it was the Democrats, my own party, that was blocking me because they liked the fact that they, the, Dem, the black community is in, in, a, in that economic situation that they're in, vulnerable 
but dependent upon the Democrats. And the Democrats can't afford to lose that 90 to 95 percent of the black vote that they get. So therefore, they don't want to let them off the plantation. I truly believe this. And it's racist. And it's so galling to think that they charge, they call other people racist who are really actually trying to do things. Like giving a mom in the black community a choice on what school she may want to send her child to when the public schools have failed so much. And I'm a product of those public schools. They're but anyway, still, they're still me. keeping them on the bottom of that vote. I believe that, keeping them dependent on purpose, by design. They won't say it, but I know it. I recognize it. I was there. I was there in Congress seeing it, and I saw it a lot when I was governor. And when I was a Democrat governor, and we could fix some of that, and really make those changes, that's where the resistance was from the Democrats, Madigan and the bosses of the Democrat Party. What do you expect in 2024 presidential elections? Well, I, I think President Trump uh, is the likely Republican nominee. I mean, he's way ahead right now in the polls. Many think that Trump may be too old for the White House and that it's better for him and for the country uh, if he supports DeSantis for president. What do you think about that? I think that's, I think that would be very wrong. DeSantis is uh, not ready for prime time. He's uh, plummeting as a candidate because, you know, sometimes the media builds you up a certain way. Sometimes you have a certain image. But when you get into a, an arena like that, presidential politics, the people get a chance to see who you are and get a feel for you. And right now, how DeSantis has run his campaign, people are getting to know him better and they don't like it for whatever reasons, whether it maybe is a lack of uh, appeal, you know, whatever the reasons might be. DeSantis, in my opinion, is, um, is too much of a typical politician. He wouldn't have been the governor of, of Florida. He was a congressman, not very well known, running for governor of Florida, and he was way behind until he asked Donald Trump to help him. And Trump didn't really want to do it, but he did it because they had worked with DeSantis when he was a congressman. And Trump was the reason DeSantis won. It was very close. He was way behind. But Trump was the reason he became the governor of Florida. I don't know how you can run against a guy who helped you like that. It's, it's great disloyalty, but yet it's common in politics. That's the thing about politicians. They're, most of them, they're just very opportunistic, have no loyalty. They are duplicitous and they'll say, they'll speak out of both sides of their mouths. And, and some of, of them are worse than others. And in DeSantis' case, he's just, his blatant lack of loyalty not to support Trump in this election. And I think people see that, and that's why he's doing so poorly right now, and Trump's doing as well as he is, among Republican voters. The other thing is, if you've been a, a supporter of President Trump, and you'd gone through those four years when he was president, and he was being persecuted with the fake Russian collusion stuff that was generated by the Clinton campaign, when you go gone through the four years, and then all of a sudden he calls the president of Ukraine because he's got probable cause to think that something the Bidens are doing doesn't look right. Because President Biden at the time is a vice president bragging about how he was able to withhold a billion dollars of federal aid to Ukraine until they fired a prosecutor who was looking into his son, into the company his son was making money in. That's potentially criminal. And the president calls the president of Ukraine and they impeach him for that. All these persecutions and witch hunts against Trump his supporters have lived it with him, and it creates a bond. And that's why they're never, they're never going to leave him. And that's among the reasons why DeSantis it can't get traction. Because these people, you know, yeah, DeSantis, you might be the new kid on the block and the new shiny object, but this guy fought the battles with us. And he's been fighting and getting his indicted and facing charges. So it, it cements their support for Trump even more and makes DeSantis' candidacy a lot more irrelevant. Um, and then, so therefore, I think Trump will be the Republican nominee, and I think Biden is likely to be the Democrat nominee. I hope he is. Because really? I hope so. Because you think the, the Democrats will go with it, like Michelle Obama or something? Candidate, maybe. It you know it's not impossible. I still think I think I still think that the smart money says Biden's their nominee. He's the incumbent president. It would be unprecedented that he doesn't. It's happened before, but it doesn't happen a lot. And I think Trump against Biden in a rematch, the dynamic is different. I think Trump can win that election largely because most of the American people feel like we're going in the wrong direction. So and it's he, critical that he wins Trump so that he can go to Washington and, and really seriously So you think he's things. still capable to be a president? Very much so. I, I think uh, 
I think he's in a very strong position to be president. And I think the irony is that the more they try to destroy him with these fake indictments, the stronger he gets and the more the American people see through it. And it helps him politically. I do. I met you at the reception of Air Serbia. Yes. Like a couple of months ago yeah. in, in Chicago. So also at the Consul General of Serbia in Chicago. Uh, does this mean that you are returning to your roots? Yes, I, I suppose it does to some extent. I've been away for so long. I can say that in the 2,896 days that I spent in prison, there were no Serbians there. I don't think there was a single Serb that was there during my years in prison. It's interesting too because I remember when I was little growing up and my Uncle Willie would talk about how Serbs are law-abiding citizens. And you look at the jails, because he, he used to be a Chicago policeman. You're not going to find Serbians, Serbian people who are in prison or incarcerated. This was a generalization, right? There's, of course, exceptions always. So we are decent people without political power. Exactly. And hardworking people. Yes, of course. What to do about that? Got to be smart politically. You know, got to get a lot more sophisticated politically. That war in 1999 would not have happened. NATO would not have decided to bomb Serbia and take the side of those who had backed the allies, of those who had backed our enemy in both World War I and World War II. They would not have done that if we here in America, the diaspora, were more organized politically. And I used to talk to the Serbs about that when I was in politics coming up and, uh, and trying to get organized. And it's still not how it should be. And they should have learned a lesson. Among the reasons why NATO and the United States took the position it did and chose the side that it did against us, against Serbia, was because Democrats in New York were raising a lot of money from interest groups connected to some of those other countries. It's, it comes down to simple political support in America, campaign contributions and political support. A lot of our foreign policy is driven by that. And America's support for Israel, which I support, I believe it's right, but it's strong because the politics here in America and the, the active organized Jewish community politically make sure that they're vigilant and that Israel's interests are properly represented. It's certainly true with India and the positions with, with the conflicts between India and Pakistan. There's an India caucus in Congress and it's viable and very prominent. And the Indian community is very successful here in America and, and they're smart and they know that they need to be involved in our political process and they have been. They were very helpful to me. And the Greek community is active politically and support candidates. Irish, they all do. They all do. Our people, for whatever reason, not so much. And uh, we're small, which is a challenge. But you not can so make small people saying that, like more than three hundred thousand people of Serbian descent are still in in, in this area. In small, land. yes, small compared to the other groups, but big enough to make a difference if they're organized and and would do it. And because Serbian people work hard and are successful in life. And they have the resources and the means if they're willing and prepared to make some sacrifices and contribute to something that's larger than themselves. They, they need to be active in the political process in America for America, for the, the interests and concerns of their children, the country we're going to build, but also for the home country, back in the, uh, the old country. Very much so, absolutely. And I think that has to be you know, pressed upon the Serbs. Look to 1999 and look what happened in the Bosnia in the, in the 90s to get an example of you know, how you should have, you, you should learn from that experience and not let that happen again. The because, last, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yes. The last time you've been in Serbia in mm -hmm. 1999, right? Yes. Uh, you traveled with Jesse Jackson yep. to Belgrade to negotiate with President Milosevic for the le release of the American soldiers, right? Right. So how did you feel then? On the one hand, as an American politician who came to save American soldiers. On the other hand, uh, as a Serb whose country is being bombed by the United States along with other NATO countries. I was, I, I'll tell you exactly how I felt. I felt, I felt broken hearted when I was leaving Serbia after we were successful and got the soldiers out. And we drove the two hours from Belgrade with the soldiers with us to um, Zagreb, across the border. And I got a flight, military flight from Zagreb to the Air, Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany, where we dropped the soldiers off. And I remember being at the border, leaving Serbia, saying goodbye to the Serbs, the Serbian officials who were so kind to me while I was there. 
And they reminded me so much of the Serbs I knew growing up because it's the same. It even smelled the same to me. I went out jogging one morning because I felt like I wanted to jog in the place my father was from because I run. And I was like four o'clock in the morning because it was a whirlwind trip those four or five days we were there and um, to try to get the soldiers out. And the media was with us all over, international media was everywhere. And an HBO guy was filming it, but I went out running along the Danube and it smelled like the picnics at Libertyville. I could smell some of the food that was on from the night before. It was, a, I think it was a Sunday that I ran. It was so Saturday night. You could smell the remnants of it. Bring back memories. Like my childhood when we'd go to St. Salva Monastery in Libertyville, you know, during the picnics. And, uh, but then when we got, we dropped the soldiers off at the border. I remember telling my aide, I, I, you know, telling them how, here's exactly what's going to happen now. You know, the soldiers are going to come home. Clinton's going to intensify the bombing on the Serbs. They won't, he won't make it easier. Now he's going to be, he'll intensify it. And they're going to go through hell now for the next several weeks. And that'll force, and Milosevic then will try to make some deal to get out of this. Because Jackson and I... Did he try to influence uh, the government to, to, to stop bombing or, or even like... I did, yes, absolutely. Be more... Absolutely I did. Now I can tell you stories about that. In fact, I can tell you a story about Joe Biden on one of the flights that I was on when I was there. So what I did when I was a congressman, I remember vividly how the war started. It was, you know, they did it on purpose, the Clinton administration. The bombing started just as the members of Congress were leaving Washington for two weeks for spring break. It was done on purpose to do the bombing when Congress was out of town. So you'd have less voices that could be heard criticizing that policy. So that was strategic and smart politically for Clinton, silencing us, those who had questions about the war. One of the guys who was with me a lot being against the war, Croatian from Cleveland, good guy, Dennis Kucinich. He and I were colleagues together. We sat next to each other in the Government Reform Committee. We were both very much against the war. And the night before the bombing started, I, he and I and a few others gave speeches on the House floor saying, don't do start this bombing. It's a sovereign country. The Rambouillet Agreement is being imposed on them. We don't do that. We would never tolerate other countries telling us to accept some territorial dispute on an agreement. And if you don't do it, we're going to bomb you. How is that not a shakedown? Really? I mean, think about what these prosecutors, they should, they should be considering that. We're going to shake down a sovereign country. And if you don't take this agreement that we're forcing on you, the referendum, which was going to clearly go the other way because of the, the demographics of Kosovo, we're going to bomb you. We're going to bomb so, until you do what we want you to do. And so we all spoke against it. I was a chief among them. And one of the things I said was, and what you're looking at is you're dealing with a guy, Milosevic, who already has a history of ethnic cleansing. And by the way, the war is about ethnic cleansing. They're all doing it. These are the nature, this is the nature of the wars in Europe. And this doesn't just happen in the Balkans. Look what happened to the Germans after World War II. 12 million were displaced, moved from east to west. And look what happened after World War I. And how, you know, the maps were changed and the different ethnic groups were moved around. That's the nature of these conflicts. And so to say that the Serbs were somehow committing genocide, which is a big lie. So it was a war of territory and, and disputes. And, but strategically, if you bomb this guy in his country, he will do to those Kosovars, those innocent people there, what he did in Bosnia, what Tuđman did to the Serbs in the Krajina region, what he said Begovic was doing in areas where he had power. This is the nature of the war. You're inviting this guy You're, you're inviting him. You're provoking him to throw 40,000. He had 40,000 troops at the border to kick out all those ethnic Kosovars. And of course, it happened exactly that way. And I have a firm belief they knew it. They wanted Milosevic to do that. They wanted a reason to go in and bomb They're Serbia just waiting so they can force that agreement. Start bombing, right? on him. Absolutely. And Milosevic was stupid that he took the bait and did what he did. He should have just taken the lumps. Because world opinion eventually would have gone against NATO, and that would have stopped. But he played right into their hands. That's my belief. But yeah, I did everything I possibly could, you know. But once the war starts, you know. Did you try to contact someone from Belgrade? Of course, I talked from to the Serbian government. From, yes, from the... I talked to all of them. I was the one who was able to get Jackson to go see the soldiers, because I was the only Serbian congressman then, and that was important too. Because I would what tell... was the answer for, from Belgrade? They were good. They were, they were. Yes, please come. Please come and not for the prisoners, but 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 for for the politics, for the like 
coming out of the situation, you know, yeah. to, to avoid the, the bombing. Yeah. Um, it, before the bombing started, they, were, they didn't think they were going to get bombed. There was this guy named Gaich who was part of Milosevic's administration in my congressional office. And he's asking me, what do you think? It's all bullshit. And I said, no, it's not. They've got to do it. Don't do it. They can, don't provoke them. Don't give them a reason to bomb Serbia. They're going to do it. And they did it. But I, you know, one of my, the arguments I made to try to get the soldiers home was that Reverend Jackson and leaders in the black community didn't like that war. And they're part of the Democrat political base that Clinton relied on. And Clinton had gotten through his troubles with the Monica Lewinsky stuff, principally because he had the strong support of the Black Caucus in Congress. And Reverend Jackson at the time was his personal religious advisor for public relations and all of that, right? And he survived that. What you have to do now is empower Jesse Jackson and make him, give him a more powerful voice in America to be against this war, because he was. He was very good that way. And Milosevic was smart enough to do that. But the follow-up wasn't right. And, uh, and, and you know, so much had happened. Once you start doing that, the world sees that you're ethnically cleansing people like that systematically. There's no way, there's no way that... But people are still thinking that that Oval Room is the reason for, for the bombing. Monica Lewinsky's case. Oh, Monica Lewinsky's case. Well, there's some truth to that too. You change the subject. You look for a war. No, there's some truth to that. I, I'm not saying all of it, but I, I do think so. It makes me sick. I remember getting choked up and almost crying when I left. Maybe even crying a little bit with my chief of staff when I was leaving Serbia. And knowing what was left, what they were going to be left with, that they were going to get, the bombing was going to intensify for a while, I felt confident that eventually it was going to stop. And when we got to the White House afterwards, when we got home, and Clinton invited us to the White House, Jackson and I, to debrief him. He, you know, we made our argument, and, and this is wrong what you're doing, and you're killing civilians, and I know you're trying to go in after the grid and stuff, but innocent people are being killed. You're destroying a country. And what, 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 what do you have against them? They're, they're for us. They love us. Serbian people love America. I have a special bond with America. And I would make that argument to Clinton. And uh, he was very nice about it, you know. I don't know if you ever met him, but he's, you know, he's a hard guy not to like. And so when he does something like that, Monica Lewinsky, you know, it's wrong. But in any event, the, wrong, the war was wrong. It was very cynical. And... Uh, a lot of fault and reasons why it shouldn't have happened. And as a Serbian American whose father came from there, and here I am the first time in my life to be in the place that my father came from. And it, it was very poignant for me because when we got there and the bombs were falling and I, I you know, they would constantly, I mean, I saw the remnants of the bombs. They were within blocks of the hotel we were at. And you'd see it at night, at night the flashing lights, you see it out of the hotel and, and then and then you'd hear the dropping of it. It was generally between midnight and four o'clock in the morning. And, um, you know, I thought, I thought, boy, the last time my father was in Belgrade was in the spring of 1941 when Nazi bombs, German bombs were falling on this capital. And the first time his youngest son would visit Belgrade is when American bombs are falling on this capital. And it's sad. Very much so. And how my dad loved America and how that would break his heart if he saw that. It was very bad. And then I was in a very tough, you know, p political position. And I love this. Of course, I love the Serbs. We're, we're Serbian. But, you know, it's understandably, very emotional, very passionate. It was so wrong what they were doing to us. And a lot of anger in the Serbian community. But their expectations and the understanding of the political process, you know, you, you have to be smart because you have to have credibility with your colleagues in Congress. And if, if you become so passionate for the place your father came from, nobody's, nobody's going to listen to you there. And so on one of the flights, this is what I was going to tell you about Joe Biden, one of the flights that I was on, because at that time I knew the subject pretty well compared to the other members of Congress. See, most congressmen, including myself, don't know a lot about most of the issues. We know certain things a lot. And then the other members come and see you to get guidance. And on this particular one, I had credibility because I knew it better than they did. And uh, I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post and I suggested they partition Kosovo, stop the bombing, partition Kosovo like they did Israel, like they did India and Pakistan. And you know, a lot of the Serbs didn't like that. My position was, you're gonna lose all of it, man. 
saved, and we had all the monasteries and the historic places, religious places there, but it was more designed for as a political statement, which they, they didn't, the passionate Serbs never could quite grasp or understand. The politics there was to weaken the resolve to just completely take the whole thing away from Serbia, but instead create political pressure where others are going to be looking for compromises, which would weaken Clinton's hold on the Democrat Party. And once he started losing that, the Republicans would leave and he would lose the support for that war. It would, you know, it was a subtle thing and it doesn't happen overnight, but it's very hard to explain to people, you know? Yeah, unfortunately we missed that opportunity. Right. You know, my father used to have this phrase, which is too much of it. Maybe I have too much of this too. Zainad, Zainad. I'm not doing it, Zainad, right? There's some of that that was going on back then, which I think was, was a, uh, was counterproductive and uh, was strategically mistaken. It's a subtle art, you know, that international politics. The other thing I learned about that from that experience was it wasn't that different from being at criminal court when I was a def criminal defense lawyer, plea bargaining and negotiating a deal which for your client. It was, it was that on a higher scale, but it was the same dynamic between people. Really interesting. So that is a history we need to rebuild the rela relationship between Serbia and the United States. I hope so. What do you think? Yes, very much so. And I think it starts here in the diaspora, American, Canada, Australia, but here by the Serbian community being getting itself organized politically with people who know what they're doing, who understand politics. And not a lot of Serbs who are active in politics who really know it. And develop relationships and have a strategic plan to make friends in high places. And I was really happy to see, I was really happy to hear from the Consul General Damjan Jovic, who's a very smart young man and uh, I think he's a good representative for Serbia here in, in America and in Chicago. He seems to be doing these things and trying to build things up. And I was really happy to hear that he had certain members of Congress, none of them Serbian, but part of a little Serbian caucus that they've started. So hopefully that's the beginning of something that can grow and develop. But developing those relationships with the members of Congress in both parties, not being all in on one party, but both parties, with members of Congress who have a lot of say in the process, they have a voice, I should say, less of a say, but more of a voice, is very helpful. But to know which ones you should go to, which ones serve on the relevant committees, which members of Congress have more influence than others, which ones' voices are heard more by the other members of Congress, this is the, the stuff that takes a certain knowledge and a know-how. And the Serbian, the Serbian community needs somebody like that who can do this. And, you know, it's a, it's a race in some respects, but it's a marathon. And uh, I met the ambassador from Serbia the day after we were at the Air Serbia event. Very impressive young guy who's a marathon runner and uh, ran the Belgrade Marathon. And I've run three, so I, we, we speak the same language when it comes to that sort of stuff. But the development of the improving relationships with the United States, developing the political network that's important to have the interests of the old country heard here, is uh, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It takes a, it's going to take a little time. But these get, some of these Serbians in business now, some of them in the logistics industry, and some of these guys that I've come home to that have had some magnificent success financially, they should be the leaders in this. They should be willing, hopefully, to invest in things, meaningful political operations, so that things can be better represented in the United States regarding Serbian foreign policy and trade. Do you still have relatives in, in Serbia? I do, yes. I very much want to go. Are you planning to, to go there sometime soon? Yes, in fact, I talked to uh, my friend Miljan Sidic, who's a very successful young Serb. I'm proud of him, the success he's had for the short time that he's been here. Um, about the possibility of trying to take my daughters and my wife, Patty, and, and go to Serbia and, and go to the village, go to the Veliko Krishmada, the, the cello my father came from. I want to see where my father grew up and I want, I want to meet my cousins and aunts and uncles or whatever the relationships might be because I don't know them. But yeah, very much so. I like that very much. I want to do it and we're going to do it. You know, my daughters are, uh, well, they're half American and half Serbian, right? I mean, their mother is very typical American. So she's, you know, three-eighths Italian. She's got some German in, or a little French in her, got a little Irish in her, and uh, some Polish, I think largely, you know, She's a mix. And so my daughters have all of that. 
but they, the other half is 100% Serbian. That's me. So the dominant ethnic group represented in my daughters is Serbian. And they love their mother and they're so close to their mother because of how she's been so wonderful raising them. But they feel, believe it or not, they, they feel, even though I've been gone, they feel much closer to their Serbian heritage than to the, any of those other groups that, uh, that they're represented by in their DNA. It's interesting. It's because the Italian part, the German part, or, or the Italian part, the, the Irish part, the French part, the Polish part, and all of that, it's sort of like you're just a typical American, right? But with me on my side and the other half that they are, it's all you're one thing. Straight Serbian. Yeah. And so they see photographs of my father here when he was a first lieutenant officer it, during, before World War II. This is at the bridge on Mostar, historic bridge. Or they see these photographs. This is my mother's family right here. Uh, she was American born. This was her when she was four years old. Chetri Godina, right? This is my dada right here. He was a wrestler and owned a kafana. American born, big family, immigrants. Uh, they see these photographs of you know, their father's mother and father and their family, and they have a real interest in it. And it, it's a joyful thing for me to share stories with my daughters Ajde about this. I tom duhu da završim ovaj intervju na srpskom jeziku. Okay. Govori vaša, malo, razumem sve. Koja je vaša omiljena reč na, na srpskom jeziku? Mama. Mama. It's the first word you say, right? Your mother. You above? I love that too. Are you, you're done? Is that it? Oh. Yeah. Mama. I think. And Ljubav. And Ljubav. Love, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Fala. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.